Hi, this is Pastor Rich with the devotion for today. Uh, and this is for the small groups that you guys, you meet and have a good time conversing and communicating. At least I hope so. I pray so. And we're looking at what we did this last Sunday. And this last Sunday we began what's going to be four weeks on Jesus being the bread of life in John chapter 6. In the beginning of John chapter 6, Jesus at the height of his popularity. People are following him. They're excited about him. They're excited about having the bread of 5,000 people being fed, 5,000 men plus women and children. And they're following Jesus, but they're following him probably for all the wrong reasons. By the end of chapter 6, when Jesus turns to them and tells them some of the teaching that he has, there's only a handful that are left, which is kind of sad, but it also shows that Jesus wasn't just trying to play to the crowd. He was trying to make disciples. And, and we see uh, our passage starting in John 6, 22 to 25, and this, this crowd searching for Jesus. And searching for Jesus sounds great. I mean, who, who wouldn't think that was a good thing? That someone says they're searching for Jesus, they're trying to find out more about Jesus, whatever it might be. We would say that's great, and it is. But as we see today, the why does matter. So in John 6, 22 to 25, it says the next day after he fed the 5,000, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples and they had gone away. So what they're paying attention to, disciples have gone, they're rowing, they know they're rowing towards Capernaum, Jesus goes away by himself. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So, remember there was a storm. A lot of people think the storm blew in the boats. These people now have these boats, say, we're going to get in the boats, we're going to go search for Jesus. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats, went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now the crowd proactively takes steps to follow Jesus, and again, that's great. They search for Jesus, and it works. They, they find him, and you think, that's great too. Uh, but why did they want to find Jesus? Well, Jesus knows why they are searching for him. And to him, the why does matter. And he exposes their wrong motive for seeking him. He looks in their hearts. He said, there's a wrong motive here. I want to correct this motive. And as a result of him doing this, again, by the end of chapter 6, he goes from thousands and thousands of people following him to just a handful accepting what he has to say, which is kind of sad. But in John 6, verse 26, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, amen, amen, truly, truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. It's interesting, later in John, they're going to be saying, hey, show us a sign. Why don't you give us, and they talk about, you know, Moses gave us manna from heaven. What can you do? <laughs> Jesus has already fed them. Manna from heaven, bread from nowhere. And maybe they just literally wanted more bread. Uh, they wanted him to produce something for them. But Jesus confronts them with, with the, their wrong motives because they had missed the point of the miracle. It wasn't free food. The point of the miracle was Jesus, and it pointed to Jesus. Not just what he could provide, it, provi it, it, it pointed to the provider as well. So the crowd had focused on the material blessing, on what Jesus had given them from a material standpoint. And there are those who come to church or come to Jesus with a preconceived notion of physical blessing and being happy. They think that what they need is what Jesus provides when what they really need, what we really need, is Jesus himself. And so the thought might be, if I come to Jesus, I'll receive wealth, I'll receive health, I'll receive blessings. And sometimes they hear the gospel kind of presented that way. But the truth of the matter is Jesus doesn't promise any of those things in this life. If you come to Jesus, the amazing thing that you get is Jesus. You get the creator of the universe. You get him. You get what your soul is longing for, that what you've been created for. In John 3, 16, it says, For God, and we all know it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the one that he gives here is Jesus. God ultimately gives himself. The question is, is having Jesus enough for you? Is it sufficient for you? Do you somehow need to have more? Do you want just the material blessing but not want him at all? Is it okay to just say, I want you um, in the sense of what you have to offer, but I don't want you in the sense of you as a person? In other words, I can take or leave you. Just give me these things. 
And I think that in, from an American standpoint, you know, materialistic standpoint, sometimes we honestly quite do, frankly do that. I think I do that sometimes. Sometimes I come to God and I say, hey, I want this stuff. I want this stuff from you. And my prayer life has this list of things that I want him to provide. And meanwhile, he's right there saying, what about me? Do you need me? And uh, sometimes I probably act like I don't, but I desperately do. So Jesus calls them to change their priorities. He tells them to stop working for food that spoils. In John 6, 27, it says, do not work for food that spoils. And that's the word may in the Greek plus present imperative is literally something that's ongoing that needs to stop. It could literally be saying stop working for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Instead, Jesus says of, of seeking physical food and material blessing, we should be seeking food for eternal life, the bread of life, which is Jesus. Jesus is teaching to seek him, not simply for material provision, but for eternal life. And it's based on, basically, bread here being a, a spiritual sense, where he is the bread, and we need him. Even more than the food that we eat. Do we really believe that? Of course, according to Jesus, it's really true. So why don't you break up into your small groups, I'll have some questions for you to put on the screen, and we'll come back and look at part two. See you in a bit. Well, welcome back. We're going to be looking at part two. I hope you had a good conversation and discussion as a group. Uh, and, and we're going to continue by looking at John chapter 6, verse 28 to 29. That's where we left off. That's kind of the end of the, towards the end of the passage that we're looking at today. And in this, we see that in Jesus, the work that we need to do is done. In John 6, 28 to 29, it says, Then they asked Jesus, What must we do to do the works, plural, God requires? Jesus answered, The work, singular, of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So the Jews hear Jesus speaking of working for spiritual food. Right? He says, Don't work for, for physical food. Work for spiritual food that is eternal and lasts forever. So they say, Okay, what are the works that we need to do to receive that? And Jesus points that, points out that it's not the work that you do, it's the work that he does. It's singular. The work that needs to be done is putting your faith in Jesus, trusting him, believing him, which really ultimately isn't work. It's his work, and it's simply receiving what he has done for us. And faith here is in the present tense. It's a continuous action. It does not just look at the act of faith, but a life of faith. Jesus is telling us to be all in. To be pursuing him, that it's a life of faith. It's not something where, oh yeah, I did, I, I said a prayer and I received my salvation and put that in my back pocket and go on my way and never think of him again. No, it impacts our life. It changes our life in some way. And he's telling us to put all of our eggs in his basket for salvation, to trust him completely. It's not just intellectual belief, but a commitment in which you, your life is invested. And the search for Jesus, again, is not for material wealth or earthly health. It's a pursuit of that which has eternal benefit. The search for Jesus is not about the pennies in the hand, right? It's about the hand of God himself. And I used an illustration. This illustration has always meant a lot to me. Uh, maybe it's because it came from Haddon Robinson, who's a professor, a homiletics professor, whom I, I really appreciated, admired. But for whatever reason, it has always stuck out to me and something that I need I always felt like I needed to remember. And, and, and his story is, is pretty simple. He, he used to, when he came home from work or from traveling, different trip, whatever he would do, he would come home and he would take pennies and nickels and dimes, whatever it might be, and they'd put him in, in, in his fist. And then his children would come, and they, they, his young children would come, and they'd sit in his lap, and they'd pry the fingers open. According to the rules, once the finger was pried open, it couldn't be closed again. So they'd pry the fingers open. Eventually, they'd pry the hand open. They'd grab the pennies in the hand. They'd run and have a good time just laughing, uh, just kids, and, and really just a game. But sometimes we do the same thing with God, right? We, we come to God and we're looking for the pennies in the hand. We might be saying, Lord, I need a loved one to be healed, or I need to be healed, or I, I need a job, or uh, Lord, I need a house to live in. All those things are really important. He wants us to come with those things, and they're certainly okay to request. But we reach for the pennies, and when we receive the things that, that, that we want from him, we push the hand of God away, and we go on our merry way. However, much more important than the pennies in our hand is the hand of God himself. We need to make sure that our search for Jesus ends with the hand of the master and not the pennies. 
So again, I'm going to have you break into groups and have a discussion. And when you're done, of course you're done. But before you do that, I want to pray for you as you gather together. Uh, uh, Father, I want to thank you for the truth that we see in this passage. That we need you. We need, we need your son Jesus like the air that we breathe. Like the bread that we eat. Like the water that we drink. We need spiritual food. We really need this. And as Americans, Father, at least I feel so often I have so much. I have so many things in the world that I feel like sometimes I don't need those things. When in reality, that is a great need. Even if it's not a felt need, it is a real need. And there's times when I do see it. And, and during those times when I'm fed with the truth of who Jesus is and I sit at your feet and I seek you out and, and, and just enjoy that time with you, I'm truly filled. I'm truly happy. I'm truly at peace. But Father, too often I neglect that myself to search for things that are the pennies in the hand. And I, and I pray for us, I pray for this group as they discuss this and talk about this, you draw them close to yourself, that you draw them closer to each other in meaningful fellowship, and that you would use this time to glorify yourself and to grab hearts afresh and anew to kind of get our attention off of things of the world and onto you. And I do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a good time discussing. Uh, I'm glad that you came to your group. And I'm glad that you let me, uh, you invited me in as well. Take care. God bless.